It was four days following Christmas last winter. Tyler Sagan was in Davos, Switzerland, representing Canada at the Spengler Cup, when he received a phone call that would change his life. I kind of looked at my phone and um, had a missed call from a buddy, didn't think of anything of it. 4,000 miles away in his hometown of Brampton, Ontario, four of Tyler's closest friends were involved in a motor vehicle accident. I heard about the accident, everything that went down, and how uh, you know they were driving all together, there's four of them, uh, my four closest friends growing up uh, as a kid, and um, it was icy out, and they lost control of the car. And... It was uh, slippery, it was snowing. I guess we were going too fast around a, around a turn. And then the car started rolling, and then I don't really remember. That whole thing was just kind of a blur until we were all sitting there with the car upside down. I'm like, I can't move, and they're like, stop joking around, Derek, like, it's not funny. I'm like, I'm serious, like, I can't, I can't feel my body. I got them to drag me out of the car, and then um, laying in the snow with my, on my buddy's lap for a bit, I called 911. Took them a while to show up. Took me in the ambulance and put a mask on me, and that's, that's all I remember. Woke up a few days later. Derek Mosichuk, a passenger in the car, suffered a broken neck in the accident. On the other side of the world, Tyler suited up in the championship game of the Spengler Cup with a heavy heart. I remember talking to calling a bunch of people and obviously in the accident, see what the right thing to, to do was. Uh, obviously, I didn't get too much sleep after that. I was definitely happy uh, that we won the game, but you know, situations in, in life, uh, in those moments where you really can see and feel that. There's a lot more to, uh, to this world and to life than just hockey, and I definitely had the, that experience right there and then. Derek would spend seven months at Sunnybrook Hospital recovering from the accident, where he received an outpouring of support from family and friends. We have a, a very close group. Oh, they were great. I don't know how I would have done it without my friends. You know, like... I'd always have people coming every day to see me. I never really spent a day alone without my friends. I don't know what I would have done. Still, even now. It almost helps me get through some days when I see how strong of a, a guy he is and how he can uh, get through what he does with uh, the situation. And um, you know, I just try to be there as much as I can. When Tyler arrived in Dallas, he decided to create a foundation in Derek's honor called Sagan's Stars. For every home game, Tyler has donated a luxury suite to those who are physically disabled. Tyler's got a huge heart, you know. Not a lot of people would do something like that. Not a lot of people care, you know. But, you know, there's good people who, who genuinely care. Sagan Stars has introduced many children to the game of hockey. Yeah, Tyler Sagan uh, donating the suite to uh, Southwest Wheelchair Athletic Association has really given us the opportunity to, uh, you know, bring new fans into the American Airlines Center. It's been really fun to get to see the kids' faces light up. Following every game, Tyler meets with his guests and signs autographs, getting to know them on a personal level. It just leaves us almost in tears when we see these kids and the excitement they have for the sport. And it's all just because of Tyler. This is what, uh, what touched me and what was personal to me, and I think, um, you know, Derek's, uh, he's a quadriplegic, so I definitely can relate and, you know, know what they're going through to a, a certain extent. So um, I just felt like that was the right thing to do for, uh, for my type of foundation. You know PK. You're learning about Malcolm, and then you'll be ready for Jordan. I feel like I'm the quiet one out of the three. That's what I hear a lot. A lot more, and uh, and P and Jordan and PK battle for the, the loudest. <laughs> it's usually yeah. me and PK bickering, and Malcolm just sitting there laughing <laughs> and taking it in. Uh, he's a goalie, so you know goalies are weird, but uh, he's weird all together. Malcolm is very quiet. PK is is so jovial and and so outgoing. Jordan is very very serious. You know, there's seven of us in our family, and if we're sitting at the dinner table and there's six slices of bread, you know, Jordan's gonna end up in a slice. You know, so. <laughs> PK's be bigger than us, so me and Malcolm used to gang up on him and put it this way, he was a sore loser. 
PK came in. He was brash and cocky, and and as a sixth round pick, told us that uh, you know he was going to make the team. And uh, but he took advantage of his opportunity. He, he from right from day one of camp, he participated well and uh, and competed well and earned his way. Outside the family, no one knows them better than George Burnett, who the Sabans are thankful coached all three in junior. He calls the boys high achievers, particularly Malcolm. Quite frankly, if his name had been Smith, we might not have drafted him. Uh, 11th round, I think we took him as a goaltender. My eldest daughter, Nastasia, came to me one day and says, Daddy, that's it. Malcolm says he's going to stop playing if he can't be a goalie. I finally asked him if I could play goalie, and he said, you know, if you want to, you'll give it a shot. If you're that passionate about it, I used to bug him every year about it. I learned a lesson there that what we need to do with our children is to support them in their dream and, and to find out what their passion is and then encourage them to follow that and, and to grow within that passion. I actually remember going to his first game as a goaltender, and he wasn't very good, and I was like, oh, my God, <laughs> what are you doing? But um, uh, fortunately, it's turned out well for him. Malcolm is rated number one among North American goalies for the upcoming NHL draft. I know how much it means to Malcolm. He might not say it, but um, he worked really hard in the summer, uh, just building up and preparing for this big year and his draft year, and it's, it's really important to him. BK has said before that Jordan will be the best of the brothers. It seems pretty cliche. The older brother always says that, but I just think it's, it's, it, that's just the way it is because he has a chance to watch, watch my mistakes, learn from them, and, and pick up the, the good tendencies that I have if I do have any. Uh, I think at the same age, Jordan's probably ahead of PK as a, as a 16 year old, and a lot of the, the experiences that PK I think had had uh, uh, training, eating, uh, summer preparation. I think a lot of those things rubbed off on Jordan well in advance of him coming into our league as, as a first year player. He uses more of a more of a size to his advantage, and I try to use more of my skill to my advantage, especially uh, playing against these bigger guys. PK's got the harder shot, but Jordan's got some better moves. <laughs> to be honest, yeah. <laughs> The parents have another dream, that the boys follow the path of their older sisters, becoming strong people in addition to great athletes. They may all do that in the NHL, likely on different teams. I don't know if they'll mix it up. Well, if they have to, they will. <laughs> you know, you're going to be a little bit worried, but, you know, it's all part of the game, so... Even now it's tough because she's still kind of a Leaf fan, I think. They wouldn't know who to cheer for. Uh, having three boys playing in the National Hockey League... Uh, not very many parents can say that other than the stalls. <laughs>The earliest sign that Connor McDavid had a natural gift on the ice came the first time he put on skates. And we got him to the ice and he sort of shook off my hand and off he went and he was just a little three and a little bit then. Not long after McDavid began playing hockey, his father Brian knew his son had a special talent, but it took some time to convince his wife. I was always very skeptical about all these hockey hockey parents and hockey dads and you know their kids get the next NHL star and Sure they are. As an eight-year-old, McDavid left an indelible first impression on future Toronto Marlboros teammate and current Windsor Spitfire Josh Hosang when the two played against one another in summer hockey. I think it's the only time in my life that I've just been in shock. I think he had two goals and two assists, and we lost 4-3, and like that was just a big smack in the face. Like, you know, I'm here, I'm younger, and I'm good. McDavid played with kids a year older than him throughout his minor hockey career. In 2005, when the OHL introduced its exceptional player status, he dreamed about doing that in the Ontario Hockey League. The whole Tavares thing was going on when I was still really, really young, and I had heard about it, and thought, wow, well, it's pretty cool, and I wonder if that could be me one day. He said, well, I'm going to leave home when I'm 15. And I said, no, you're not. I said, you're not going to leave your mom. And he said, are you going to stop me? And I remember seeing it in his face that this boy is so determined. McDavid put an exclamation mark on his minor hockey career in March when he scored the game-winning goal in the GTHL championship. And soon after was granted exceptional player status. Well, there was a couple years where people thought, like, hey, like, just go back to your own age, and I guess it proved them wrong. To no one's surprise, the Erie Otters selected McDavid first overall in the OHL draft. 
And to no one's surprise, McDavid has been exceptional. Shoots, he scores! Connor McDavid! He's a gifted player. And when he steps on the ice, he's not 15 anymore. He just knows what's happening in the game before the people do. His uh, stick handling ability, uh, his, his strength on his skates for his age is crazy. Uh, I saw a guy play at 17 in the WHA. He's a pretty good hockey player. He has the same attributes as, uh, as Wayne did. McDavid's transition to major junior hockey has been seamless. His 15-game point streak is the longest in the OHL so far this season. It's amazing. I remember, uh, I think for me, it took me like nine or ten games to score and get my first point. So for him to come in and do what he's done, it's incredible. A few weeks into the season, McDavid also earned the praise of a player whose picture was everywhere in his childhood room when Sidney Crosby told a reporter that McDavid reminds him of himself. I was just on Twitter and I saw it and I was like, holy cow, like, is this true? He shows me his phone and says, Dad, you got to see this. And I read it and I went, wow. He's been my idol since I was like eight, so uh, you know, for him to say something like that, it was absolutely amazing. Gosby, your favorite player? Me too. McDavid isn't eligible for the NHL draft until 2015, but his coach, Robbie Fatorek, sees only one limit to his talents. This guy, you know, he's got to learn some things. But he can do whatever he wants to do. Really. Shot a goal, Connor McDavid. That's the way I have to play the game. There's a couple skilled players on the other team, and uh, you know, from my experience, if you hit those guys early on, they don't really want to carry the puck into the middle of the ice uh, later on in the game. So, and, you know, it's a confidence thing for them. If they can uh, wheel around early, then uh, you know they have that the rest of the game. So I think that's kind of my job to, to step up early, give them a, a pop, and then see how they respond. Kevin BX's opponents can thank his family for his fire and his aggression. Every Christmas, the BX's and friends play for the Tin Cup no room for the squeamish. Well, as you can see, it's a very expensive trophy. Um, actually, we picked up the trophy for a dollar at a yard sale, and it's screwed onto a bunch of beer cans that have been crumpled up through all the celebration over the last few years. And uh, But more importantly, it's uh, very coveted by uh, both teams, and uh, once that puck drops, uh, uh, everything goes. It's full contact, and it would be unusual at the end of the game if a couple of players weren't bleeding in the dressing room. Well, one thing we should point out, just as we'll show here, the NHL player has never been the MVP of this tournament. Well, we're hoping that uh, Kevin, uh, you know, gets some good experience uh, playing with the Canucks there, and uh, eventually, sometime, he'll be able to play in this game and bring what uh, it needs uh, to have him uh, enjoy the honor of being the MVP. He certainly hasn't demonstrated that yet. Yeah, we kind of had a brawl a couple years ago. I don't think there was real punches thrown, but... Uh a couple, couple of my buddies and the other team grabbed me and uh, tried to pull me to their bench and my dad actually jumped over the boards and, uh, to get in there. So, Your father says he is still the toughest BXA. Is that true? Oh, he's been ducking me for the last couple of years, so I don't know. We might have to see this summer. <laughs> I think his two brothers would agree with me that I am definitely the toughest and probably his oldest brother is the one that you would least want to be in a fight with. Bieksa didn't start playing defense until he was 15 and broke his ankle in his OHL draft year. He decided to go the NCAA route where he learned that at his size, he'd have to be in great shape to play the way he wanted. In 2004, he joined the AHL's Manitoba Moose. It is a legendary story in Canucks circles that he punched out Sergei Fedorov's younger brother, Fedor, shortly after arriving in an off-ice fight he tried to avoid. Even now, he doesn't like to discuss it. What happened with Fedor Fedorov? Um, it's kind of a blur to me, I don't know. Uh, one of the first nights I was there and just a uh, little dust up in the bar, just uh, boys being boys, I guess. and. Uh, Funny thing is, afterwards, ended up being uh, friends and, and hanging out a little bit, so you know, it worked out in the end. I know Brian Burke loves telling that story. You seem a little bit more embarrassed about it than it happened. 
Yeah, well, it's obviously something that if I could do it over again, I probably wouldn't have, uh, you know, chose the same path. But, uh, you know, you learn from your mistakes. I'm, I'm lucky that it worked out for me, and uh, don't encourage anybody else to, to follow the same footsteps. <laughs> Truth is, off the ice, BX is a calm, quiet person. He is exactly the man his parents wanted him to be, aggressive on the ice, respectful off it. I know when he comes across a tough situation, either on the ice or off the ice, that uh, he remembers uh, the lessons and, and the learning experiences we went through when he was younger. What's the most important one? Probably respect. He's my mentor and uh, you know, he taught me everything I knew. So. You know, the product of what you see today is, is from him. Uh, you're ready. I used to go watch him play in the, uh, uh, the Stelco Leagues, which is a factory back in Hamilton that he worked. And uh, I don't know why, but it was a full contact league back then. And <laughs> it was pretty rough. And uh, those are my earliest memories of going to the rink. He basically said, well, my goal was never to get drafted in the NHL. My goal was to play in the NHL. I'll get excited when I actually make it. I'm very proud of that. On many teams, he would be the go-to star. On this one, Patrick Sharp frequently and unavoidably blends into the background. I get plenty of recognition for what I do as a player, and, and, and that's that's enough for me. Uh, we've got a number of great players in our locker room. You mentioned Kanan Taves. You know, we got Marion Hossa. If you look at what he's done in his career, is unbelievable. Uh, you know, we've got Duncan Keith and Brent Seabrook. So you go up and down the lineup. We've got a number of great players. Um, yeah, I'm just happy to be one of them. Well, in all that company, do you ever feel underrated? Uh, sometimes, and that's that could be a good thing. Uh, when you're underrated, you can kind of kind of sneak around a little bit and uh, catch people off guard. So I'm kind of one of those guys where they stick me where you need me, and I'll do the best I can. Well, let's just look at Kane and Taves. They were drafted because of their superstar potential, and both of them have become that. Uh, your road to the NHL is nothing close to the same. How different has it been? It's been different, you know, and growing up, uh, I have a late birthday, I don't know if has that anything to do with it. I've always been one of the smaller, undersized players, and uh, you know, hockey was different back then. There was an emphasis on size and strength and toughness and you know, a lot of clutching and grabbing and physical play, and, and I always just had to find a way to survive and get to that next level. It wasn't like one of those players like Kaner or Taves that you could point at at 13 years old and say, this guy's going to be an NHL hockey player. I just one of those players that had to continue to work hard and, and get better at every level, even up until I was in the American League uh, in the minors. So I'm proud of the route that I took and I think it's made me a, a better player to this day. His hard work has got him noticed and Sharp's star power is not to be underestimated. He is hugely popular in the Windy City and was once voted Chicago's sexiest athlete. <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, I still can't live that down. <laughs> What lives in Sharp is a burning desire to win, instilled in him by his parents, Ruth Ann and Ian. Am I going to get in trouble about the hockey pad incident? That's probably a good one to tell. Oh, okay. Patrick was probably about five or six years old, and they were out playing street hockey in the back. And Patrick, I guess, being as competitive as he was, um, got mad when they lost the game. So he promptly went over and took the goalie's um, stick. So then the goalie took off his goalie pads. Patrick picked them up and promptly rocked rub them in the mud. It certainly sounded, Patrick, like at one point in time you were you were headed for a life of crime, weren't you? Yeah, I was in trouble. <laughs> I uh, had a little bit of a temper growing up and uh, I think that kind of goes to having an older brother that always bailed you out of trouble and bailed you out of situations like that. So I don't want to use the word brat, but uh, I had a few families in the neighborhood that were too, weren't too happy with me, but uh, you know, I apologize to that kid whose pads they were. Sharp is all about family. His parents, his brother Chris, his wife Amanda, and their year and a half old daughter Madeline, who would define a second Stanley Cup win. Just the other day I was at dinner with my wife and we were talking about how cool it would be to, to win the cup again and this time have Madeline on the ice and skate around there uh, and have her experience all that and look back one day and know that she was there doing it too. We played the uh, Florida Panthers, but I think we were staying just outside Fort Lauderdale. So I knew Timo liked cars, so I set up so we could borrow a fancy sports car. 
Doug Porter she got the convertible. But... Newman and then Freddie Olison was there too. You know what, I knew we were on the road. You know, I can't remember the name of the restaurant, but somehow it came up during the conversation. It was there in a Fort Lauderdale restaurant during his second NHL season that Solani decided to tell his teammates the end was near. I told Thomas Dean and Freddie Olsen that I'm going to play max four years and then, then I, I'm going to go back to Europe and play there. And they both started laughing. I asked, like, why are you guys laughing? You don't know. You have no idea. I said, I know, I know. I, four years max. Maybe even three. So right away I said, I'll bet you that never happens. He said, oh yeah, I, I, that's what I'm going to do. I said, no, I'll bet you. And I said, how much? I can't, I'm not going to hold that against him. And uh, he shook my hand. I heard it was a million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> but don't tell anyone. Oh, God. Uh, I, don't think, I don't think it was that much. I thought that first year, even how good it went on the ice, uh, the lifestyle and the, the energy what you have to spend. Obviously, that time we didn't have a charter flights, and, and it, it was way tougher, the whole package. It started wearing me out in the end of the year, and I said, you know, I don't, I don't know how these guys can play 20 years in this league this way, you know. But that time I felt that it's so much easier to play in Europe. We play only that time 44 games. No traveling, no those long road trips. So, you know, I think every year it starts getting easier and easier to get used to it. NHL history is grateful. Thomas Steen, now a Winnipeg City Councilor, won the bet. Somebody scores! Power play goals, third most all time. The prestige of the NHL image wouldn't have been the same if Solani kept his promise. Hello, uh, Timo. Hi. Uh, I just want to say, yeah, you're my hero. <laughs> That's not <nice>, true. <laughs> With his charismatic smile and a boyhood enthusiasm, the slam dunk future Hall of Famer has become one of the most cherished ambassadors of the game. Teemu is a sports icon in Finland like no one else. Teemu is not uh, the basic Finn. He laughs a lot. He spreads the joy to the people around him. He's a really good guy. Despite never playing in an original six city, he is one of the most adored hockey players worldwide. Solane, a big budget documentary from Finland, is expected for a September release in theaters across Solane's native land. Producers are also hoping to release the film in North America. Every player's dream is to go out with your own terms. But the question is, when is the right time? If you feel you can still play well and you, you, uh, you enjoy to come to the rink every day, that's a big question, like when it's time to, to say no.